flagship. And this uh, flagship was originated by actually the say, discovery or, or the demonstration of graphene in 2004 and the Nobel Prize in, uh, for graphene in 2010. And the goal of this project was to bring uh, these new materials, these atomically thin two-dimensional materials uh, to uh, practical applications. So I'm going to tell you something first about graphene and then about uh, graphene is just a prototype of all materials that are, are uh, atomically thin that can be reduced to just one atomic layer. And as, uh, since my expertise is mainly on uh, ultrafast spectroscopy, uh, after a general introduction of these materials, I'm going to tell something about the ultrafast uh, optical response, how these materials, uh, how the uh, excitations relax on, on fast time scales in these materials. So as an outline of these lectures, I'm going to first give a very broad introduction to graphene. Then I'm going to focus on the optical properties of graphene. And then I'm going to move on to two-dimensional semiconductors, so other materials that can be exfoliated to atomical t atomically thin materials, but that are semiconductors, different from graphene, which is a semi-metal. And then I'm going to show you how one now can start from these atomically thin two-dimensional materials and stack them on top of each other, and one can form heterostructures of two-dimensional materials. So now you, are, you can fabricate new materials just by stacking atomic layer by atomic layer, different materials, and this gives a very great freedom of engineering new material properties. So let's start with a broad introduction to graphene. So, what is graphene? Uh, graphene, uh, if you consider uh, allotropes of carbon, so the, the word allotropy comes from the Greek allos and tropos, so uh, you c is one of the different forms of a chemical element. So, a uh, chemical element carbon can, can exist in different forms, different allotropes, and here are two examples of allotropes of carbon, which are diamond and, graph and graphite. So you see that in diamond, uh, the carbon atoms are, are arranged, are um, linked to each other by uh, sp3 bonds. So you have tightly bound uh, um, atoms and you have an insulator. While in graphite, you have uh, uh, the atoms are linked together with, uh, in this case, uh, you, you form this, net, this plane of uh, network um, of atoms linked together. And then you have several planes uh, held together by uh, non-covalent bonds, by Van der Waals bonds. So this is graphite, essentially what you have in your pencil. Now, what do you do if you thin graphite more and more uh, until you reach a single, uh, play, a, a single atomic layer? Then you, are, uh, have, you have graphene. So graphene is simply a one atom thick layer of the mineral graphite. In this case, you see that uh, the carbon atoms are arranged in a honeycomb, sort of chicken wire lattice. And this is the prototype of materials that, have, that are so-called two-dimensional materials because they, have, they are atomically thin. They, have, they are only one layer of atoms. Now, how can you produce uh, graphene? So, to pro uh, essentially, so first of all, if you look now at this material, you see that uh, the carbon-carbon uh, bond distance in, in graphene is 0.14 nanometer, and uh, the interplanar spacing uh, in graphite of these single layers is 0.335 nanometer. So it takes about 3 million layers to make 1 millimeter of graphite. Now, what do you do if you exfoliate more and more the graphite? You, you, you can end up to a single layer. Now, uh, there are uh, other uh, carbon halotropes that can be obtained starting from graphene and wrapping it up in zero, uh, one, or three dimensions. So if you are in three dimensions, you stack uh, gra uh, graphene layers one on top of each other, you get graphite. Now, if you take uh, a, a piece of graphene and you wrap it around uh, itself uh, in a zero dimension, you, you, you obtain a, a ball of uh, atoms of carbon, which is a fullerene. Or you can wrap the graphene in one dimension, then you obtain a tube, which is known as a carbon nanotube. So these are the different forms of carbon that you can obtain. Now, if you look at fullerenes, 
Fullerenes are uh, molecules made of 60 carbon atoms arranged in a sphere. And uh, they, the, the, the name comes uh, in the honor of the architect ba Richard Buckminster Fuller, who designed the geodesic domes that re recall this uh, fullerene molecule. And these were first synthesized in 1985 by Harald Kroth, Robert Kahl, and Richard Smalley, who got for this the Nobel Prize uh, in 1996. Now, uh, carbon nanotubes, on the other end, are uh, a piece of graphene wrapped uh, around uh, um, uh, itself to form uh, uh, tubes with different diameters, but typically around one nanometer, and that can be much longer. They can be long as, as much up to millimeters. And uh, they have also been discovered well uh, before graphene, and they also have been investigated for the unique mechanical, thermal, and optical properties. Now, if you go to graphene, how can you obtain graphene? So the first uh, method of production of graphene was simply by micromechanical cleavage. So you start from this graphite, which is strongly layered, and then you, you slice it down, you cleave it down, until you uh, get a single atomic plane. And this was performed uh, by Gaim and Novoselov, actually by Kostya Novoselov. And this is really uh, the, uh, you see the signature of Andre Gaim. This is really the, the, the equipment that was used. You take a piece of graphite and you take some scotch tape. And by progressively uh, t uh, trying to exfoliate thinner and thinner uh, amounts of graphite and depositing it on a substrate, you get down to a single atomic layer. So this was, uh, uh, at the time, uh, both, uh, they still are, I think, uh, in Manchester. They were in, Ma uh, Novozero was very young, was probably already, was a PhD student or a postdoc when these experiments were done. And uh, uh, so this was one of the so-called Friday afternoon experiments. You know, when you are on a Friday afternoon, you have worked the whole week, so you try something a bit unusual. And so they said, okay, why don't we try to exfoliate graph graphite and see if we can get to a single atomic layer. And that's indeed how they succeeded in uh, uh, producing the first graphene. So this is a way also telling us that uh, sometimes you don't really need, uh, as was mentioned in the previous lecture, what is important are ideas more than funding, because the funding required to make uh, the first graphene was really very limited. So anybody could have done this. And uh, uh, so these are, uh, Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov, who received the Nobel Prize in 2010 in physics. Kostya Novoselov was really young, was 36, for groundbreaking experiments regarding the two-dimensional material graphene. Now, this is the first uh, image of a single-layer graphene flake that was uh, exfoliated and deposited on a silicon, silicon dioxide substrate. And you can see optical contrast, which is different for a monolayer and a bilayer, that allows you to uh, recognize when, when you have a monolayer. And by exfoliation, you typically get flakes of, graph of, of graphene that are on the range of a few tenths uh, or, or of, of microns. So very small flakes, but uh, which are truly uh, two-dimensional, truly of atomic uh, thickness. And this is an AFM image where you, you can really see the carbon atoms arranged in this kind of uh, chicken wire uh, uh, arrangement. So uh, th this was, uh, uh, of course, graphene was predicted, was known uh, since, since many decades, but it was thought that it would not be stable. It, it was thought that once you make graphene, graphene would kind of uh, uh, change either wrap into a nanotube or into a fuller, it would not remain stably two-dimensional. So this was the pioneering result. Already, only about 15 years ago, was the first demonstration of a two-dimensional material. And now, uh, since then, uh, technology has evolved very rapidly. Of course, with micro-mechanical cleavage, uh, you can make a very limited uh, uh, surface, very, very limited uh, size of this flake. Maybe if you are really good, you can make millimeter squared, but not more. And these are still the flakes that have the best physical properties, the ones that are mechanically cleaved. But this is really more an art to be able to cleave and get a really a, a, a big flake, which is a, a single layer. 
since then there have been uh, uh, other methods. You, you can have a carbon segregation of metal or sil silicon carbide. You have, in particular, chemical vapor deposition on a metal substrate allows you to make uh, very uh, large, uh, to cover very large surfaces with a single layer graphene. Uh, it is not uh, as uh, high quality as the micromechanically cleaved, but you can really cover, as I will show you in a moment, very large surfaces. Another uh, method worth uh, mentioning is liquid phase exfoliation. So you start from some uh, graphite and uh, by uh, using a liquid with co combination with ultrasounds, you exfoliate it until you get a dispersion of flakes in liquid. Sometimes it's called a graphene ink. And this is maybe not necessarily a single layer. It can be um, maybe a, a, a mixture of several multi-layers with different thickness. But with this, you can generate uh, easily large amounts of material. But the CVD process on copper allows you really to create very large surfaces. And there has been a dramatic progress, especially in the Asian world. People have really realized this potential. And this is a procedure for making graphene roll-to-roll -roll production. So you grow the graphene on a copper foil. Uh, then you, you use a polymer support. So you transfer the graphene uh, to the polymer, and then uh, now you, you are able uh, then to, um, to transfer graphene, to a single layer graphene, to a very large substrate. Here you can see a 30 inch single layer graphene. So this, of course, allows this material to be used in, in, in many practical applications, exploiting its unique properties. Now, what is so special about graphene? Of course, uh, uh, in this lecture, I can cover only a very limited uh, uh, amount of properties because there are really many properties and many different applications. So first of all, it is an atomically thin sheet of carbon. It is a flexible, light, and abundant material. As I will show you, it is a very good electrical conductor. It has electrical mobility uh, much higher than the best uh, semiconductors such as silicon. So it has potential for high-speed uh, electronics. Uh, it is a conductor, but it is transparent. So the combination of these two properties is not common because typically transparent materials such as glasses are, are, are uh, insulators, electrical insulators, while a good electrical conductors such as, met as metals don't transmit light. Now, uh, there is the, the most important uh, transparent uh, uh, conductor that is used in all displays is indium tin oxide, ITO, which uh, combines two properties. Now, graphene uh, can compete with ITO in combining these two properties. So it can be used as an electrode that also transmits light. So this is very important for displays. And then it has uh, uh, very remarkable mechanical properties that I will not cover in this lecture. So it is uh, the one of the strongest materials known. So it can be used or incorporated in uh, lightweight composites. So there is really a very broad range of multidisciplinary applications uh, of graphene that range from uh, uh, composites, transparent conductors, photovoltaics, uh, transistors, uh, electronics components, even membranes, gas barriers, for example, is another important application. And all these applications rely on uh, its peculiar uh, physical properties. So in this lecture, I'm going to focus in particular on the unique uh, op electronic and optical properties of graphene. So let's uh, uh, discuss now the optical properties of, of graphene. So uh, first of all, uh, let us consider the electron. In order to understand the optical properties, we need to understand the electronic structure of graphene. And now uh, you can uh, quite simply understand that if you consider this uh, uh, graphene structure, uh, each carbon atom has four electrons in the outer shell. So three of these electrons are hybridized sp2. So you have this very strong covalent bond. But then the fourth electron is free to move and is delocalized along the plane. So graphene is a very, has a very high electrical conductivity. It's a very good electrical conductor because of these free electrons. Now, if you look at the band structure of graphene, you see that it is very, very peculiar. So uh, in a typical uh, semiconductor, you would expect uh, 
a parabolic uh, band structure of energy with respect to momentum. So in graphene you get these two cones in the valence and the conduction bands. Uh, the, these two cones, they touch at this point that is known in, in a, in a, in a, as a Dirac point. Now, if you consider intrinsic or undoped graphene, you have that this lower uh, band, this lower cone, uh, is the valence band, is completely full, and uh, the conduction band is completely open. So, uh, graphene behaves as a semi-metal. So, uh, you have a filled valence band and an empty conduction band. But now, uh, if you look at the dispersion relationship, meaning energy with respect to wave number, you get this expression, where you see that there is a linear, uh, as you would expect for a cone, there is a linear um, uh, relationship between energy and wave number k. And now this proportionality is the so-called Fermi velocity, uh, which is 8 to 10 to the 5 meter per second. So particles behave as so-called massless Dirac fermions. Now, this very peculiar electronic structure has some important uh, consequence on the optical uh, properties. So, you, you know, an optical transition, basically, since a photon has no momentum, or, or negligible momentum, let's say, with a, so a, a, um, an optical transition is typically vertical. So it connects the state with the same uh, wave, wave vector. So here you can see that, basically, if, if you have an intrinsic graphene, you have uh, uh, electrons in the valence band, and you have a, f a completely empty conduction band, so you can make this transition at any, any energy of the photon, any, any frequency. So uh, while in a semiconductor, when you have a band gap, you cannot absorb below band gap, in graphene, you can absorb light at any wavelength. So you can make these vertical transitions connecting lower and upper Dirac cones at any wavelength. So graphene, it is the only material that can couple light to light at all wavelengths from the mid-infrared to the ultraviolet. So what I, if you consider undoped graphene, of course, if you dope the graphene, then uh, things change because then you, you will uh, occupy uh, either the uh, conduction, uh, you will create either electrons and conduction bed or holes in the valence band. Now, you would think if, if you consider any material that you would uh, thin it down to a, a single atomic layer, you would think that the absorption is negligible. How much can an atomic la a single layer of atoms absorb? But you find that the absorption of graphene is constant and it is relatively high. It is 2.3%. So this is, of course, not a very high absorption, but if you consider that it comes from a single atomic layer, it still uh, display, demonstrates a very strong light-matter interaction. So graphene in, say, from the mid-IR to the ultraviolet range, in general, absorbs as a constant absorption of 2.3% per layer. Now, this, of course, uh, is a quite unique property. So if you take any dete light detector based on a semiconductor, this will have a band gap, so it will work only in a limited, um, in, in a limited range of frequencies. Now, graphene, due to this universal absorption, it can absorb light at any wavelength, so it can absorb any color of light from the mid-IR to the visible to the ultraviolet, and it has a potential for, a very, for an ultra-broadband detector, so a detector that can respond to light at any, any color from the mid-IR to the visible. And of course, each of these uh, regions of the electromagnetic spectrum is important, so having a detector that can address uh, all of these simultaneously has very big uh, potential. Of course, uh, you have a problem that you absorb in a single layer only to a, a, a low amount, but you can try to enhance this absorption by, by different techniques. Uh, then, uh, also, these detectors have the potential to operate at much higher speeds with respect to conventional photodetectors. Now, another property of graphene, as I was mentioning, is that it is a transparent conductor. So, uh, Graphene combines high electrical conductivity with high optical transparency. So if you see the other way, you consider a single layer of graphene transmits more than 97% of the light. So it's basically transparent, but still it's a conductor. So you can use it to replace indium tin oxide in screens such as liquid crystal displays, flat panel displays, 
plasma displays and so on, touch panels. So you can really use, and this is one of the first real practical applications uh, to use graphene as a transparent conductor, uh, also in photovoltaics, of course, uh, because you need it every time that you, you need an electrode that can also couple light out of, out of the device. Now, another really remarkable property of graphene is electrical tunability. So typically a material has uh, some absorption which cannot be easily uh, tuned uh, electrically. You can shift it a bit, maybe by stack shift. But with graphene, you can really have dramatic effects. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, graphene couples strongly to light because a monolayer uh, displays uh, this constant absorption of 2.3% across visible and infrared ranges. But now, here I'm showing you intrinsic graphene, so meaning that the, the balance band is completely filled with electrons. The conduction band is empty, so I can make transitions, I can promote electrons uh, in these vertical transitions, uh, basically with photons of arbitrary energy. So I can absorb light at any wavelength. But now if I tune my graphene, uh, for if, I, if I put a gate and I shift my Fermi energy, now for example here I am depleting the balance band of electrons, so the graphene now cannot do these transitions anymore because there are not, no more electrons, so it becomes transparent. And I can very easily shift it. So I can, ch I can make graphene either absorptive or transparent electrically. And this is uh, not so easy to do with a material to control its optical properties electrically and also very fa in a very fast way. So this is ideal for applications to optoelectronics when you want to modulate the transmission. So you can make a very efficient uh, graphene modulators. So how does it work? Here you have, uh, uh, you have a, a, an optical waveguide that transmits light. This is typically, say, 1.5 micron, which is the wavelength used in optical communications. So this, this is a silicon waveguide. Light is transmitted through this silicon waveguide. And on top of this waveguide, you have your graphene layer. So you see that. Uh, uh, you will have, uh, this is the mode of the waveguide, there will be an evanescent uh, part of this electric field that uh, sees the graphene. So part of the light transmitted this waveguide sees the graphene on top. And now, uh, I, of course, the graphene will absorb, even if it absorbs a little, but if you uh, put it on top of this waveguide, it, it can result in, in a very large absorption. But now you can change, uh, uh, by changing the voltage, to the graphene, you can now shift the Fermi level and you can make the graphene uh, completely transparent. So electrically you can very quickly modulate, and, and this you can do at any frequency, from the infrared to the visible, you can modulate the transmission, uh, uh, the optical transmission of the material, because by shifting the Fermi energy you can, uh, um, you, you can change the, the uh, you can bring it from absorbing to transparent, essentially. Now, uh, as I told you, my uh, main uh, specialty is uh, um, um, looking at ultra-fast optical response of materials. So what graphene is also a, a material that has an extremely fast optical response. So what happens if you come, if you promote with, with, uh, with light, with some photons, absorbing some photons, you, you, you promote some electrons from the balance to the conduction band. So here I'm showing you, let's say, if you do it with a short light pulse, suddenly you bring these electrons up from the balance of the conduction band. So you, bring you have electrons in the conduction band, you have holes in left down in, in the balance band. Now, these are, uh, of course, uh, this is not an equilibrium. This is not uh, like a Fermi-Dirac uh, distribution. Then the first thing that will happen is that these electrons will very quickly thermalize in a time less than uh, 50 femtoseconds, and they will establish this uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution. So the electrons equilibrate with themselves. But now the electrons are hot. They can reach very high temperatures of thousands of degrees. But the lattice of, of, of the graphene is still cold. So the next step, sorry, will be electron phonon scattering. So this uh, takes place on a very fast time scale on the order of a picosecond. Now, we can, so graphene then recovers its original uh, state within a few picoseconds. So it has an extremely fast optical response. So it is an optical switch 
that can rec be open and closed very fast. And this is also uh, applications. So how can you uh, detect this? Uh, uh, um, as I will show you also later on uh, in, in different cases, uh, you can uh, you study this ultra-fast carrier relaxation by so-called pump probe experiments. So you, you take a first uh, uh, light pulse, the so-called pump, that promotes the electrons in the conduction band, and then with a given delay, you come with a second pulse, the probe, that measures uh, how the transmission changes. So what you typically see in graphene is that uh, you are promoting electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. So now uh, you are uh, putting electrons in the conduction band. Now, if I come with a, a, a delayed pulse, now th these states in the conduction band that I could have reached without the pump, now they, they, they are occupied. And by the Pauli exclusion principle, you, you cannot put other electrons there. So you have what is called Pauli blocking. And so uh, you cannot absorb anymore, or you reduce your absorption at this specific uh, wavelength. So uh, by exciting graphene, its uh, uh, transmission increases. So you have, a, in, the, in the sense, a switch because uh, uh, from absorptive it becomes transmit transmissive. So it increases its transmission. And, but then this recovers very quickly. So first of all, this is a measurement of the, how the transmission of graphene you see, first it increases very quickly, and then it recovers. There is a first uh, uh, very fast decay uh, due to the uh, coupling with the so-called strongly coupled optical phonons. And then uh, you have a, 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 a slower decay due to equilibration with acoustic phonons. But after a few picoseconds, basically, the material has returned to its original condition. So it's an ultra-fast switch. And this also has applications, for example, you can use graphene as a so-called searchable absorber. So you can put graphene in a laser. And now, uh, if you, uh, this is like a, a switch that opens when you have high intensity, but then closes immediately. So it forces the laser to uh, emit uh, light in form of a train of pulses. And you can put this uh, graphene inside the laser, and automatically the laser starts to go into the so-called mode locked regime. And uh, uh, so, uh, it, because it, it, it uh, finds more convenient to emit, uh, instead of a, a continuous wave, a train of pulses, because these train of pulses, high, having high peak power, are transmitted more, easy, more, have a higher transmission coefficients from the graphene. So this is another quite unique property of uh, uh, graphene. Now, uh, graphene, uh, as I said, was just the beginning of the whole field of two-dimensional semiconductors. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you consider now all the good properties of graphene, it's the thinnest material ever. It is uh, transparent, uh, but still uh, electrically conductive. It has an absorption quasi independent of optical wavelength. It is strong but flexible. It has high thermal conductivity, high electron mobility. It, it is made of carbon, so very abundant material. However, it is, uh, it is not a semiconductor. It is a semi-metal. So this makes it difficult to use graphene in, in electronics because electronics is based on semiconductors. So soon after the discovery of gra or, or the demonstration of graphene in 2004, it was realized that many materials can be exfoliated just in the same way of graphene to being uh, atomically thin two-dimensional materials. And now the field is exploding, and there are really many materials that can be exfoliated and that have different properties. Some of them are semiconductors, some of them are insulators, like boron nitride, some of them are superconductors. So there's a really wide uh, variety of materials that can be exfoliated and become uh, atomically thin. So uh, here I'm going to focus in particular on the semiconducting two-dimensional materials and on this class known as the transition metal decalcogenides. So if you look at the periodic table, you, s you are combining uh, some transition metals, M, with some calcogen atoms like S, SE, or, or T. And you have the chemical form MX2, where M is a transition metal and X 
is, 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 is a calcogen. So you can have, uh, uh, okay, here I, I wrote 40, but it's probably much more. It's probably hundreds now, nowadays of different compounds that can be, uh, re that are all layered and can be reduced to atomically thin two-dimensional uh, materials. So the first one that to be exfoliated that became like the prototype of this new family is a uh, molybdenum disulfide, MOS2. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to focus mainly on this material, but as I said, there are many more. Now, uh, how, 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 is this, uh, how is this done? It's not a really single, uh, single atomic plane. Here you, you see you have three layers, three planes. So you have uh, the transition metal, the molybdenum, that is strongly covalent, strong covalent rebound with the sulfur in this case. So you have a very strong intralayer bond between the metal and the calcogen. So you form this uh, structure and then you can have several of these layers that are held together by very weak bonds, essentially Van der Waals bonds, so you can easily exfoliate it. Uh, so uh, when you go to a single layer, in this case uh, the um, uh, layer thickness is on the order of 6 to 7 angstrom, so 0 0.6 to 0.7 uh, uh, nanometer. Here you can see an atomic force microscope of a single layer. You can really see here when you go, you see the, the, the thickness of 6.5 angstrom. And so again, you can produce this material by mechanical exfoliation, just uh, uh, like, you do, like you did with graphene. But uh, uh, again, uh, mechanical exfoliation, of course, gives very small materials. Here, uh, they are even smaller than uh, 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 then uh, um, graphene, so maybe you, you get flakes of a few micro squared <laughs> that are truly single layer. But again, uh, now uh, there is a, a very intense activity in, in developing different technologies that are not a mechanical scotch tape method. For example, chemical vapor deposition now can make uh, uh, surfaces with a very broad coverage, although you typically tend to create this kind of triangles. Uh, that, that but you can kind of homogeneously cover with these triangles of single layer the, the surface. Or you can have again this liquid phase exfoliation, so you can make inks of, of these materials. Uh, so again, the progress is being very, very, very rapid, although these materials are very old, but uh, the discovery that they can be exfoliated to a single layer dates back. Uh, to the maybe 2010, 2011, and since then there has really been an explosion of interest in these materials. Why? Because they share the properties of graphene of being two-dimensional materials, but now they are semiconductors. And in addition, they have some really remarkable physical properties that I will now discuss in, in the remaining of my talk. So first of all, uh, taking MOS2, but this is true for all these materials, uh, you know a semiconductor can have a, a direct or an indirect gap. So the di indirect gap means uh, that the minimum of the conduction band and the maximum of the valence band are a different wave vectors. And this is not good for emitting light uh, because light emission requires uh, that uh, the wave vector is conserved. Uh, on the other hand, a direct band gap uh, has uh, the, the maximum of the, of the valence band, the minimum of the conduction band with the same wave vector. And this has a very strong uh, light emission. Now, the peculiar properties of these materials is that they are in direct band gap when they are multilayer. But then uh, when, they are, when they go to a single layer, due to quantum confinement, these uh, levels go up in energy and down here. And then the, the, the lowest energy transition remains, uh, remains uh, at the direct, direct point. So they become suddenly when going from two layers to one layer, they go from indirect to direct band gap. And this is a, a dramatic effect. You can see the lumi since uh, uh, indirect band gap semiconductors do not emit light, you see the luminescence is nearly zero for a two layer. Then you go from to one layer, the luminescence increases by two orders of magnitude. So suddenly it becomes emissive. And only when it is a single, single layer. Another uh, very interesting property is, is uh, uh, that there are very strongly uh, confined, very st uh, excitons with very high binding energy. So what are excitons? So in, in a semiconductor, you typically think uh, you, you, pro you promote an electron in the uh, conduction band, you leave a hole in the valence band, 
But then uh, you can think uh, that this uh, uh, electron and hole form like uh, an hydrogen-like system. So that there is an, an attraction between the two. So they, have a they, they form an like a small hydrogen atom, which has a certain binding energy. Now, if you take a standard semiconductor, this binding energy is extremely low. It's a few millielectron volts. So in a, sem in a uh, semiconductor at room temperature, this uh, and this uh, um, uh, binding, the uh, thermal energy is much higher, so these excitons are destroyed. So in a semiconductor, you think about free electrons in the conduction band and free holes in the valence band. But here, this increases enormously for two reasons. First of all, because now you are getting a two-dimensional quantum confinement. So now you have a semiconductor that is only one atomic layer thick. And then the second reason is that if you, it's a quite trivial problem of physics. If you consider the hydrogen atom, the binding energy uh, of the exciton depends on the dielectric constant uh, of, of your medium. Now, if you go from a bulk material, you will see that uh, the lines of force of, of this field, they essentially see the dielectric constant of the semiconductor. But now, if you have a material that is only one layer thick, then you see that the, 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 the field lines of the electric field, they go outside. Well, there is no, uh, the dielectric constant is basically one, so there is no screening from, from uh, uh, there is no, no screening from the medium. So this increases the exciton binding energy by two orders of magnitude. So in a normal semiconductor, you have a binding energy of a few milliliton volts. Here you have hundreds of milliliton volts up to one electron volt. So you really see the excitons at room temperature by naked eye very strongly. So you get something like this. You really see these very beautiful peaks. And indeed, these are absorption spectra of uh, uh, the most uh, uh, popular transition metallical cogenides, uh, MOS2, MOS2, WS2, WS2. You see they all have these very strong peaks at room temperature that uh, are due to these excitonic transitions. Uh, now, uh, OK, uh, OK, you, maybe I can skip this. This is just a comparison. Here you see in gallium arsenide, the typical bulk semiconductor, you have a binding energy of a few MeV. Here you have a binding energy of uh, 0.3 EV in this case. And you can nicely see the so-called Rydberg series uh, of, of the exciton for different levels, so you can really uh, measure it experimentally. So these excitons are stable even at room temperature. Now, uh, I told you it's a, it's a direct band gap semiconductor at the K point, and uh, it has these two excitons, A and B excitons, which are due to a strong spin-orbit uh, interaction in the, in the valence band that splits the states in the valence band. Uh, so here you can see the typical absorption spectrum with these two peaks that are so-called A and B excitons, and uh, with uh, the uh, uh, this is the so-called C exciton. Now, there is uh, another very interesting property of these materials, uh, which is uh, uh, so-called valley-dependent optical selection rules. So you have these two... Uh, um, these, now, uh, you see that you have here this hexagon. Now, here, since you have uh, 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 different elements, you, you will have a broken uh, symmetry. So the result is that you have two valleys, the K valley and the K prime valley, which are uh, not uh, degenerate, and no, which are degenerate in energy, but they can be selectively populated by circularly polarized light. So if you excite uh, light with, uh, if you excite the semiconductor when it is one dimensional, with circularly, with two dimension, with circularly polarized light, with, uh, for example, one helicity, one, one is either right or, or left circular polarization, you will get, you will access, uh, you will access uh, one of these two valleys, while with the other polarization, you will access the other valley. And uh, now, uh, this can be, um, is remarkable because in, typically in semiconductors, these two valleys cannot be selectively excited. So this means that uh, when you uh, excite with circularly polarized light, you can, em you emit, uh, you, you can address one valley, and uh, uh, so the emission will have the same circular polarization as uh, the uh, absorption. So you, you basically get emission, which is again with a very high degree of uh, uh, circular polarization. 
And this is a unique property of this material because of the so-called spin ballet locking that, that, that you have due to this two-dimensional character. Now, um, uh, this can uh, give rise to a field that is called uh, balletronics. So you, can, you know that uh, typical electronics uh, works with the charge of, of uh, uh, electrons as a degree of freedom. You can think of spintronics where you use the spin as an additional degree of freedom. Here you can now use the valley as an additional way of storing information. So in principle you can address one or the other valley and this can be taught as possible ways of writing information either one bit or, 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 or the other bit, for example, in one valley or the other valley. Now, uh, okay, um, let me see how much time I have, and, and not much, but uh, okay, m maybe I'm just going to give you one uh, example uh, of uh, how we use uh, uh, ultra-fast optical spectroscopy to study non-equilibrium properties. So let me give you a, a very brief introduction to ultra-fast uh, pump probe spectroscopy. So uh, this is a technique that is very general. Here I'm showing you one of these two-dimensional semiconductors, but it can be applied to any material. And uh, uh, so what you do is you excite the material with a light pulse, the so-called pump pulse. And then you come with a time-delayed probe pulse, and you measure the transmission of, of this probe. And uh, then uh, you repeat the same experiment. You, you still measure the, the transmission of the probe without the pump. And then uh, you calculate what is called the transient transmission, which is the difference between these two values. And of course, this difference will depend on the time, on the delay between these two pulses. And now, uh, I, um, essentially, how do I do it? I, I have a sequence of pulses of pump and probe. And uh, then, uh, typically, with a, with a chopper, that can be a mechanical or other kind of chopper, I can switch on and off the pump pulse. And so I can measure the transmission of a probe with pump, one without, and then, and then measure this transmission. Uh, now, uh, in, in the end, I move my delay with a mechanical delay line. And then I will get a map like this where I get here the time delay, which I control uh, with a mechanical delay line. And here I get how the transmission spectrum of my probe changes as a function of frequency and as a function of uh, uh, delay. And then I can take a cut of this map at a given delay, I get, I get a spectrum. I can take a cut at a given time and I get a dynamics. So this is a very powerful technique that gives me very rich information on how uh, the um, excitation evolve in, in these materials. Uh, so maybe uh, this is just uh, uh, one example of what you, you, you can learn from these materials. So uh, for example, I can see that in some cases my transmission increases, or in other cases uh, with the pump uh, my transmission decreases. So I will get my differential signal that can be either positive or negative. And so uh, I, I can now um, uh, consider the different possible sources of this signal. I create, for example, with my pump electrons in, in the conduction band. And now what I can have is uh, uh, increased transmission simply because I am bleaching. Uh, I, I, this is called photo bleaching or Pauli blocking because now I am occupying some states. So if I come with my probe, I will see uh, an increased transmission. Or I can have a stimulated emission. Now I am creating, I am putting some electrons in my valence band, with my, pro, with my conduction band. With my probe, I can stimulate the emission down to the valence band. Or I can have a photo-induced absorption from the conduction band to some higher lying states. So um, let me maybe, I'm going to skip a few slides. Let's see if I can maybe, because I think in the last few minutes, I want to show you the last topic, and I'm going to show you some examples of spectroscopy on, the, on these, which are uh, now heterostructures of 2D materials. Now, having established that you can make graphene, you can make these two-dimensional semiconductors, now you can add a, 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 another very big degree of freedom by stacking these materials on top of each other. And uh, uh, so essentially, you can mechanically assemble 
uh, you see one layer of graphene, one layer of metrical cogenides, another layer of graphene. So you can really put these materials on top of each other. And the good thing is that they are held together by the same van der Waals interactions that hold together them in, in the layer materials. So there is a very big, uh, uh, you preserve essentially the individual layer character because uh, uh, you have these very strong covalent bonds. But uh, you don't have, if you want to make an heterostructure of semiconductors, like you do, for example, uh, in optoelectronics, uh, you need to, if you want to put, to put together two, two different semiconductors and make uh, two, two, two different layers, you have to take to account that the lattice have different, um, they have different lattice periods. So there is a lattice mismatch that limits the capabilities. But here, you, since you have this van der Waals interaction, you, have, you don't have any limitations. So if you are able, of course, to assemble these heterostructures, you can really put together many different materials uh, and you have an almost uh, a, a unlimited freedom. Uh, so you can make many different devices which consist of heterostructures of these two-dimensional semiconductors. So mm, I just want to show you two examples. Uh, one example is uh, uh, a heterostructure of uh, graphene with, with one of these transition metal decalcogenides, for example, WS2. Uh, here you have uh, uh, graphene, which is a semi-metal, so has no gap, and you combine it with this WS2, which is a semiconductor. Uh, so in this case, uh, you, will, uh, uh, you, you have also some very interesting optoelectronic properties. The other uh, case is an heterostructure of two semiconductors. In this case, I'm taking, for, for example, WSC2 and MOSC2. I'm taking two single layers and I'm stacking them on top of each other. Uh, so uh, what happens? Now here you get uh, uh, two uh, semiconductors. You see you, you get uh, two different uh, uh, electronic uh, gaps uh, with, uh, um, uh, in this case, WSC2 as the higher band gap with respect to MOSC2. But now you get uh, this uh, so-called type 2 band alignment. You see that now uh, you, you have the minima of the conduction band and the maximum of the valence band that are on different layers. So what happens now uh, if you excite, for example, the MOSC2, which is the lowest energy semiconductor? So you, you create an electron in the conduction band, you leave a hole in the valence band. You don't excite this, this semiconductor because you are below the band gap. But now you know that holes, electrons tend to go down holes tend to float up. So here this all finds this uh, state which is at higher energy. So there will be a very fast uh, hole transfer. So now the hole goes to the other material that has not been excited by light. But now I am separating specially the uh, electron and the hole. Now I get what is called, I, I still get a bound electron hole pair, but now the electron and the hole are sitting on different layers. I get what is called an interlayer exciton. And this has completely different properties with respect to the electron and hole sitting on, on the same material. So you see that I get a, a huge new degree of freedom. And just uh, uh, to show you this example, this is an experiment that, that we did uh, in collaborations with the uh, University of Texas and ICFO. Uh, so we, here you see there are these, uh, they are extremely small flakes on the order of a few microns. Uh, squared, but you can stack them on top of each other in this case, and you get here a region where you have your heterostructure. So you have MOSC2 and WSC2 put on top of each other. And you can see uh, here the absorption spectrum of one, the absorption spectrum of the other, and when you combine them, you see that uh, you, you can more or less recognize there is some shifts, but you can recognize the peaks of, 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 the, of the two materials. Now, we do a two-color pump probe spectroscopy. We excite the, uh, elect the exciton, the bound electron hole pair in the MOSC2, and then we look at what happens in the other material. So uh, essentially, uh, this is the result. So uh, when I excite uh, the MOSC2, I'm exciting at this material, and I'm looking at this other material. So when I excite only the MOSC2, I see a weak negative signal, which is a photoinduced absorption. Uh, now, if I excite only the WSC2, because on this uh, structure I have all the three materials separate, 
uh, then I don't see any signal because I am, I am exciting with a too small energy. But now, if I excite my heterostructure, I see a signal that is uh, growing uh, on the WSE2 and is becoming much, uh, much stronger and it's growing uh, not instantaneously but with a given time. So what this signal is due to is really I'm exciting now this electron hole and the hole is hopping from one material to the other and I can time resolve very, very clearly that it takes 230 femtoseconds uh, for the uh, uh, hole to jump from this to this. So uh, this is the interlayer hole transfer time, for example. Now, if I look uh, at uh, uh, also what happens once we have formed uh, this uh, interlayer exit, then it decays on a very long time scale, because now the electron and the hole are separated, and it takes much longer to decay. And uh, uh, so, uh, OK, there is a temperature dependence. Maybe we can skip this. Now, the last example I want to show you, and then I finish. Uh, is uh, an heterostructure of uh, uh, one of these two-dimensional semiconductors with graphene. Uh, again, now I am putting together a, a, a material with a band gap and a material with no band gap that absorbs light at any wavelength. So I'm taking WS2 on top of uh, uh, single-layer graphene. Now, uh, what happens? When I excite the structure uh, above band gap, above the band gap of the semiconductor, I see a very characteristic signal of the A and the B exciton uh, of the semiconductor that decays with, with some uh, time co exponential uh, decay on a picosecond time scale. So I am essentially exciting my semiconductor above band gap. But now, if I go below band gap, the semiconductor doesn't absorb anymore, but now the graphene will absorb. But still, I see pretty much the same signal. So Essentially, I am uh, exciting, even if I excite the graphene, I am transferring some excitation to the semiconductor. Now, this goes uh, to some higher lying uh, uh, gap, because here I am exciting well below the band gap of the semiconductor. So, uh, OK, I can do some fluence dependence, but basically the, uh, the result is that if I excite my heterostructure, I, I see the signal. But if I excite with low energy just a semiconductor, I see nothing. So it is really something coming from graphene and going to the semiconductor. So, uh, OK, let me uh, maybe skip this and come directly to the result. So what we are seeing is hot electron transfer. So essentially, we are creating uh, with uh, uh, graphene some electrons in the conduction band, as I was telling you before. These electrons very quickly thermalize. And so you will have a, 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 Fermi, a, a Fermi Dirac distribution, so you will have this tail of electrons that have quite high energies because they will collide and so some will acquire very high energies. Now I'm putting my uh, semiconductor and, my, and the electrons can very quickly to tunnel from the, um, uh, um, while they are still hot, they can very quickly tunnel from graphene to the semiconductor. And in fact, uh, uh, this is very consistent uh, with previous measurements, our um, power law dependence of the signal. So essentially, we are exciting the graphene below band gap and we are resolving this uh, uh, very hot uh, electron tunneling to the, to the, to the um, semiconductor. And we can do this with very high time resolution. And we see that uh, this is essentially a, a time constant of, on the order of 20 femtoseconds. So we see that we, if we excite the graphene, very rapidly the electrons will tunnel from the graphene to the semiconductor. So you can see that really by putting together this two-dimensional material, you get completely new uh, optical properties and you, you, and you get uh, uh, a lot of uh, physical uh, um, new properties that you can exploit uh, for many applications. And with this, I think I come to an end of my presentation. And uh, yeah, I thank you for your attention. So thank you, and I think now there's time for some questions. Yes. Can you show the last slide uh, where you have this, uh, ex exactly. So I mean, 
uh, the efficiency of the process depends on these thermalized electrons, how many are above the conduction band of a semiconductor, is right? Yes, exactly, yes. So it could also be that there is no effect at all, depending on the position of the conduction band? Uh, well, uh, essentially you will generate uh, with... Uh, um, uh, what you do is you, genera you generate this uh, hot electron distribution, which of course will depend on, on uh, how many electrons you put in the valence band, in the conduction band, so on the electronic temperature. And then, of course, depending on, on this uh, band gap also, you will have a certain tunneling probability for doing this. So in principle... But the efficiency of the process, how much is it? Well, uh, um, it's... Uh, um, uh, you mean uh, it, it's, it's not a very... Compared to the number of excited electrons on graphene, how many are ending up in the band, in conduction band of a... Yeah, it, it's, it's not a very high efficiency, it's probably on the order of percent or lower, because you are getting a tail of these electrons. But uh, the nice thing is that uh, you are exciting well below the band of the semiconductor and still you are getting an excitation. Uh, it's, uh, it How much well below? I mean, uh, well, do, you, uh, do you serve a threshold in well, this Well, uh, we go essentially uh, down to, let's say, 0.8. So this semiconductor has a band of 2 EV and we still get uh, up to 0.8 EV, so more than two times lower. Uh, we, we get uh, uh, the we see the signal on the semiconductor. And uh, you can think that you can, you, you, sometimes you can do what is called multi-photon excitation. So you can absorb more than two photons, uh, or two or more photons. But then uh, this would give a non-linear dependence, uh, which we don't see in our data. So we have... Uh, dependence uh, of the excitation uh, power also. Yes. Uh, um, so um, uh, it, it is clear that uh, it is uh, uh, not uh, a multi-photon excitation. In the also because if you go to the semiconductor alone, you don't see anything mm -hmm. because you are well below, yeah. below, below threshold. Then I go there. Uh, you can what about the red shift that you see in the absorption spectrum? Does it have any, any correspondence that you find with, uh, with this you, you mean which red shift? Uh, this one? No. Ah, okay. In the stack, yes, this depends essentially on the refract because now uh, when you do a heterostructure, you have a different refractive index, and the refractive index shifts the absorption, shifts the excitons. So if you have an exciton, essentially, uh, you have a substrate, you can have uh, one layer and then air or you can have another layer on top, and this influences uh, and, and it, it induces uh, some red shift uh, of these bands. But you cannot get any... W well, you, 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 you can see by this red shift that, that you have two semiconductors on top of each other, but uh, then uh, you don't know whether they interact, whether they exchange. To do this, uh, you need to do one of these kind of time-resolved experiments. Just a general question, do you think that this calcogenide can be used as, uh, how long is the lifetime of the emission of these materials, more or less? Well, uh, this is uh, um, quite a debated question, actually. Um, uh, it, in, in principle, it can be as long as a few nanoseconds. It depends, there are uh, what are called Auger processes. So when you, ex when you put, uh, when you create electron holes, when you create excitons, these excitons can annihilate, so they can meet each other. One uh, is, goes, relaxes back to the uh, ground, and, and the other is excited to higher energy, and this destroys uh, from two, you get one. Mm -hmm. So if you go at lower uh, uh, intensities, you, you can prevent this. And the other, the other point is that uh, these materials are quite new, so um, there is not yet uh, a very systematic study on the um, effect of the quality of the material. So some of the materials are exfoliated, so for example, they have defects, some have more or less defects, more or less doping. Uh, so um, I think if you have a really pure material without any defects, then you can have a very high um, um, lifetime. lifetime and very high photoluminescence quantum yield. Do you think that there is a future for this material in photo-induced electron transfer or something, right? in order to use the excited state of this material to do something? Well, for example, with these heterostructures, you can get uh, it's a very nice uh, way of separating the charges, and, get, and then they get uh, really long-lived charges. So, for sure, they can be, then they can be extracted, they can be used uh, 
in, in photoinduced electron transfer. It works also in solution? I mean, uh, well, uh, yes, uh, you can, uh, um, let's say, these experiments that I showed are on uh, flakes put on, on, a, uh, on a substrate, on a transparent substrate. But uh, you can also work in solution. You can make what are called the inks of these materials. So you can exfoliate them. And then uh, you, can, um, yeah, you can put them in solution, essentially. Other questions? Alain? Um, in, in which sense, you mean? That means when you have a sheet, yes. the optical properties are going this way or the other way? Well, um, they can go in both ways, I would say, in the sense that uh, uh, typically, uh, well, well, typically, okay, uh, if, you, if you have a, a single layer of graphene, you go perpendicularly, so you see the absorption of 2%. But, for example, in this modulator that I showed you, th then, uh, then you are uh, going, uh, you, you have like some evanescent wave that sees the graphene and then it can go also transversely. Uh, you mean the, the pump power that pump you, when you do this pump probe experiment? Uh, well, uh, we try to stay in a so-called linear regime where, we, we, I mean, we would like to use uh, uh, typically as low power as we can. Uh, we need, uh, the problem is we need to detect the signal. So uh, if you have a very stable uh, uh, instrument, you can, uh, you, you can very gently excite uh, this material. Um, but uh, typically it's... Uh, um, you are talking of fluences in the order of microjoules per, squ per square centimeter, which are, say, um, you typically, um, the, the, the densities are not very high of charges that you put. So you, you don't sit for its uh, nonlinearities of uh, the 2D materials of semiconductor uh, materials? Uh, well, uh, well, um, here, okay, the, this experiment is a nonlinear experiment. So the transient absorption is, is a third order linear experiment. These materials also have a strong, uh, have nonlinearities. For example, graphene as a, uh, I mean, if, if you think of these materials, so the first time I started, people told me you should do experiments on these materials. I said, okay, I can do it, but I will see nothing because what can I expect to see from an anatomically thin material? And, uh, but surprisingly, these materials have an extremely strong nonlinear response. So, for example, graphene uh, has a um, third order nonlinear response coefficient, it's called chi 3, which is uh, six orders of magnitude higher than uh, um, most of standard materials, uh, like uh, transparent materials. On the other end, uh, you have to consider that uh, these materials are, ex are extremely thin. So, uh, the, if, you, if you make uh, if you have an extremely strong nonlinear response in these materials, but uh, uh, the overall effect is still very small because the thickness is, is just one atomic layer compared to, let's say, millimeters. Uh, what you ah, from graphene. Well, graphene, uh, you can use it for storage. Well, one uh, hypothesis that is, for example, people in the IIT in Genova are working a lot on this, is to use graphene for storing uh, uh, hydrogen. So you can uh, uh, kind of uh, think that the hydrogen can, can attach to, to the graphene, and then, uh, I mean, you can do this, for, in this case, for fuel, for st storage of fuel. Uh, other applications, you can use graphene in supercapacitors. So if you want to make very, very large capacitors, you can also exploit it. Uh, so these are several applications in energy. I have one question. It's mostly on the previous comment about the uh, effects of, uh, of the 2D material. First of all, uh, uh, how inert are they? Because you can have them in solvents, but how stable are they in solvents? Well, they, they are quite stable, these materials. Um, actually, um, they, of course, uh, um, what you can do if you want to make them even more stable, and uh, uh, what people are doing, they, they, you can encapsulate them. So you have one of these uh, two-dimensional materials, which is uh, a boron nitride. 
a boron nitride is a, um, a large gap semi semiconduct uh, insulator, let's say, and you can also make it uh, um, one layer or, or few layer. So if you encapsulate these materials between uh, this boron nitride, then it becomes even more, uh, say, the properties increase a lot because this kind of uh, suppresses interaction with the environment. Uh, uh, but in general, they are quite stable, I would say. Yes. Yes. And then in, in overall, and I guess it's still a very new, mm -hmm. uh, how would you believe that those electrons that are uh, separating, uh, those excitons are separating, how those electrons, how, how available are they to do the chemical reactions? Yeah, okay. So, first of all, to your first questions, I think it is true that uh, if you put one of these materials on top of each other, the spectra shift. But on the other end, they are retained. Here you see you have A and B excitons, A and B excitons. Now, if you put them together, it's true that they shift a bit because of this dielectric environment. But still, the individual layers maintain essentially their properties. It's not, uh, they don't form a new compound with different properties. So you, you really have one semiconductor and the other. Now, uh, they can be separated. Now, the question is, how are they available? This is. Uh, uh, something uh, that uh, maybe one should investigate. Uh, it's, uh, but for sure, they, you, you, you are separating. Uh, uh, in principle, now, what people are, uh, are starting to do is they can put, of course, it's, uh, at the moment, uh, these are really something, things that came out in the last three or four years. It's really new. You can now start to put three or four of these materials. So you can make a cascade. You can really make a gradient. Uh, and you can separate them even more, in principle. And then they hopefully can become even more available for doing uh, photochemistry. So, thank you again, uh, Professor Cerullo. <laughs> and uh, I think that for today it's all. Uh, we'll see you here tomorrow at 9. 9, yeah. Have a nice day.